<coughs> sorry. Hello and a very warm welcome to today's session brought to you by Team Grade Up. I hope you all are doing really well. So the course of this lecture, we will be looking at a very important romantic writer who is a second generation romantic poet, critic, as well as uh, he's considered to be a lyrical poet. Along with that, of course, he is laying the foundations of some important aspects of criticism. Shelley was the first to profess that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of mankind. That means they, there is this important role that poets are definitely creating and even when we talk about the most famous works of Shelley for example Ode to the West Wind he's clearly trying to talk about how the West Wind is an agent of change and so is the poet he's trying to rather make a comparison between the poet and the West Wind so of course an extremely eminent second generation romantic that is a part of your curriculum that is a part of your syllabus whom we have to definitely do in greater detail and we'll of course be covering it to, uh, through the course of today's lecture so let's very very quickly get started with the topic of discussion today that is Percy Bysshe Shelley married twice very influenced by uh, the the parents of the second wife that's Mary Shelley and of course dying at a very young age at the age of 29 years because of a boat accident but yet creating some remarkable literature which is representative of the revolutionary and optimistic spirit that romanticism has always stood for so we will of course be covering we will be looking at Percy Bysshe Shelley as a part of your today uh, lecture that's the, going to be the main theme let's very quickly get started I will also share the stuff so that all of you know that the video has started now when you're talking about PB Shelley you get questions that are coming directly in your teaching exam so your teaching exams have got direct questions that are asked from Shelley so this is something that you have to definitely keep in mind whenever you are looking at Percy Bysshe Shelley okay so let's very very quickly get started and today we will be looking at Shelley and tomorrow you have a quiz uh, that will be there on PB Shelley. So whatever we study today, whatever PDFs are provided to you over the telegram on Shelley, try to revise them, try to go over them, try to ensure that you are clear. And after this, you know, you're not really spending a lot of time at least creating your notes on Shelley. So try to compile, curate, put everything that you have related to PB Shelley together, especially some of you, uh, I saw some of the queries for RPSC exams that you've written or for the UPPC as GIC exam that you're writing, you must be aware about P.B. Shelley because he plays an extremely important role. All right. So do remember uh, that this is crucial. All right. So let's very, very quickly get started. Let's see how many of you have joined us over here. I'll just, uh, yes. So I can see Tiasa is there. There is uh, Satya, there's Seema, there's Sushil, there's Dhanlakshmi, Tenzing, Arakshan, Swati, Rupa, Gunjan. Uh, all right. So let's very, very quickly get started. Let's see at the classroom platform how many of you have been able to join us. I can see some of you who have already joined. There's Sushmita, Rachna, Saketi, Niranjana, Rabia. Good evening, everyone. There's Nargis. There is is, uh, oh my god, yes, Suketi, I forgot. I'm sorry. Wishing you a very happy belated birthday, Suketi. May God bless you with ample of health, wealth, prosperity, success, happiness. And don't worry at all. We'll probably, uh, like, you know, celebrate your birthday once when you clear the exam very soon, right? Happy Basant Panchmi, Sushmita. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, Rabia, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for asking. There's Abby. Uh, yes, Nargis is asking, do we have a class at 10 p.m.? See, tomorrow, uh, sorry, yesterday I was not able to take your 7 
PM class as I had taken an, a visit to the grade up office. So your uh, class that was scheduled yesterday at 7 p.m. has been rescheduled to today at 10 p.m. So that class which was supposed to be happening yesterday, which is dealing with how you can remember stuff will take place today at 10 p.m. So it's scheduled for the 16th of February at 10 p.m. OK, so yes, that is for 16th of February at 10 p.m. There's Moon Moon, there's Dr. M, there's Abdullah. Uh, there is, uh, yes, Sushmita, in the next class at 8 o'clock, I'll be updating you about all those details as well. Don't worry about it, OK? Uh, there is, uh, um, yes, Abdullah, I'm doing well. Thank you so much. There's Rachna, Pratibha, Pooja. Good evening. There's Rohan, Ima. Hi, Ima. There is Kalindi, Kuhu. Hi, Savitri. Good evening. Glad to see you. Hi, Yogesh. Hi, Anjoy. Um, Good evening, Kismat. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for asking. Hi, Aziz. Hi, Kabir. Okay, let's quickly get started. So tomorrow you have your quiz on PB Shelley. So make sure that you are revising PB Shelley properly. Make sure that you're doing PB Shelley in the best possible manner because that is definitely important. So let's very quickly get started. Before that, I had posted questions. So I hope you know that uh, since the 15th of February, that's yesterday, we've started a daily question for the day that we'll, of course, be discussing in these classes very very quickly so this was your question for the day the question for the day that was posted on uh, like you know that was posted on 15th will be discussed in the 10 p.m. lecture now here when you're talking about this is actually a German word for your self experiment now self experiment is a very famous story of Christa Wolf right so Christa Wolf is writing this story and it is a very integral part of your postmodern literature so when we are talking about the self experiment the self experiment is about this woman female scientist who takes a part of the experiment and this experiment is converting her from a woman to a man even though this was written in 1972 but it is actually talking about 20 years later it is talking about a situation that is 20 years later and it's telling you how scientific temper is associated with rationality and that is associated with patriarchy so there were multiple layers there were multiple meanings this was a very important work uh, as it is we will be looking at your postmodern fiction because you get multiple questions coming from postmodern writings uh, this is very similar to your cyborg theory that we will of course discuss when we look at postmodernism but do keep this in mind right but do keep this in mind that when we talk about this is the German name and the English name becomes self experiment what is the English name over here so when we are talking about when we are talking about this this is actually a German story which is which uh, whose English title is self experiment self experiment is the English title and this has been written by Krista Wolf. So this work that you are looking at, this work has been written by Krista Wolf, and this was written, this was written in a communist Germany in 1972 but it is actually talking about a period which is in 1999. So it is written in 1972 but talking about a period, sorry 1992, 20 years later. It's talking about a period 1990, uh, in 1992 to 20 years later and it's telling you about the spirit of experiments that had become very common the spirits of how you were experimenting how you were questioning thereby certain identity roles that is of course becoming extremely crucial over here so this particular work that we are talking about you should be aware about it this is self-experiment by Krista Wolf this is self-experiment by Krista Wolf and we will of course discuss this there's another question that you know Krista Wolf uh, after the sex change becomes whom Krista Wolf after the sex change becomes a man called Anders Krista Wolf so uh, Krista Wolf's protagonist is the female experimenter she becomes what after the self experiment she becomes Anders after the self experiment she's becoming an Anders and she's representing that how scientific experiment is associated with patriarchy so this is a work that is dealing with an experiment which is dealing with the with, with a sort of you can say uh, like you know conversion it's, it's actually looking at the conversion of this female into a male and uh, this is what self experiment is dealing with written by Krista Wolf a very important part of your postmodernism so whenever you talk about postmodern writings whenever you're talking about postmodernism this is definitely playing a very crucial role right particularly you know uh, this is related to postmodernism and gender that how Krista Wolf is questioning the notion 
notion of gender then right so identity is being very fluid yet the society paying a lot of uh, pressure on women so of course this is related to postmodernism gender performity how gender is basically a performance right the aspect of performity this is a very important topic we will definitely schedule a class on this because you do get questions related to that right hi bandana good evening so do remember that that self experiment self experiment is a work by krista wolf you know these are the kind of works where you don't have a lot of uh, um, you don't have a lot of input now if you would have searched this if you would have searched this that's the reason every day i'm writing don't uh, use google but try to touch your own uh, try to test your own instinct it'll be fun just think that you know if you if this was a question you got in your exam what you you would have answered now why i'm giving you these kind of questions these are very different questions you'll never find them anywhere because they are of course created ones and this book if you try to search it you will get german wikipedia you'll not get the english wikipedia but still it is a very important postmodern work which has actually really touched the postmodern spirit that is the reason it's an important work for us okay so do keep that in mind this is very very important all right okay now coming on to the topic for discussion when we are talking about pb shelley pb shelley was certainly a radical pb shelley was an optimistic person he genuinely thought that the order could be changed he was a person who's moving out of university is moving out of university and uh, that is predominantly because of the fact that he cannot compromise with his ideas he can't really compromise with the ideas that he's having he can't really uh, ever ever compromise with the spirit that he's a part of right so sorry so that is of course an important aspect he is technically if you have to place him technically he is a second generation romantic he is a living a very short life but even in that short duration but it's it's bigger than uh, it's bigger than keats for sure so uh, he is a second generation romantic and in this particular part what are we able to observe he is one of the only second generation romantic who's actually radical who still has that radical impulse who genuinely believes in the changing of order who genuinely believes in the idea so william godwin uh william godwin telling us about selvig williams for example telling us about how it is important for a citizen to assert their rights that is their duty now when we are talking about shelley at eton college right he was absolutely independent and that is the reason people called him the mad shelley or an eton atheist this is a question that you get in your set exams at nauseum now why was he considered to be the at eton atheist eton was a college where he had gone and he was was a professed person who did not believe in the power of god right he he thought that god was not there and uh, but he, that didn't mean that he was never spiritual he always believed in the power of nature that is the reason you are able to see that you know in multiple works of his nature is presented in a very powerful way so you know what was happening with these romantics these romantics were going inwards they were going inwards and they were trying to look for uh, of course like you know they were having their imagination but they were trying to look outside for symbols that were a associated with their imagination they were trying to look outwards right for the symbols that could communicate their imagination what was there inside the mind what was there inside the mind that was of course very important all right so do keep that in mind do remember that that why is he called an eton atheist of course he does not believes in that ritualistic religion for sure all right and when he was at his college he had actually written two wild gothic romances right two wild gothic romances you've got the zastrosi as well as saint erwin or the rosicrucian right these two gothic romances were written their names often come in your exam that which were the two important gothic romances that were written when he was there at eton so you must keep that in mind that is zarathrusi as well as rosicrucian these are the two works zastrusi 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 and rosicrucian and rosicrucian these are the two important works that he's writing at eton and because of the fact that he was a person who was always uh, doing his own uh, things he was an icon uh, iconoclast he He wasn't really believing in uh, ensuring to follow the herd mentality, and he was an independent spirit. Therefore, he was called mad. Therefore, he was called Mad Shelley or Eton atheist. Therefore, he was called Mad Shelley or Eton atheist. Right? He was therefore called Mad Shelley or he was called Eton atheist. So do keep that in mind. That is of course important, right? And when we are talking about at the University College in Oxford, he of course continued to read radical authors. Uh, he had a very different way of dressing. 
dancing, had a very different behavior, uh, something very similar to your Lady Gaga, right, that you have. And in 1811, with Thomas J. Hogg, he wrote The Necessity of Atheism. The Necessity of Atheism. Hogg, of course, was saved because Hogg was well associated, but Shelley had to. Shelley had to face, like, you know, expulsion from the college campus. Why? Because he had written The Necessity of Atheism. This is, again, a direct question that you get in your exam that which work, which work of Shelley led to his expulsion from the office, the necessity of atheism led to the expulsion of Shelley. So if we are looking at this first slide and if we are looking at your piece of papers, what are the certain things that you definitely have to keep in mind? The first most important thing that you have to keep in mind is that when we are talking about Shelley, Shelley is a radical opportunist, right? Uh, optimistic. He's a radical plus he is very, very very optimistic in most of his works he's talking about especially the longer works especially the longer works we'll come on to that he is a person who's considered to be a lyrical poet as well his lyrical quality is also getting appreciated by almost everyone uh, so clearly he is intelligent and very different that that's of course the thing the second most important thing that you have to remember is that he's an independent spirit he's an independent spirit because of which he's called mad shelley or eaten atheist right the two works that he's writing at Eton are Rosicrucian and Zastrozzi right so that this is something that you have to keep in mind and at Oxford along with Thomas J Hogg he's writing the necessity of atheism because of which he's getting expelled at Cambridge at Oxford when he's writing at Cambridge when he's writing that that is what we are seeing at Cambridge when he's writing this is not a, this is a, this is a different work that he's writing it's a gothic romance Saistafreen it's a gothic work that he's writing it's a gothic work that he's writing so the three points from this slide that you have to remember first he was a radical he was an optimistic person he genuinely believed that order could be changed that we could actually look for change in order he was very lyrical he was very very lyrical secondly he's very famously called as the mad shelley or eaton atheist right this is something that you have to remember and the two works that he's writing at eaton they are important and the third point that you have to remember is necessity of atheism that he's writing with Thomas J. Hogg. The necessity of atheism that he's writing with or uh, with Thomas J. Hogg. These are the three things that you have to keep in mind. These are the three things that you have to keep in mind and you get direct questions that come in. Now, please remember, before we go any further, before we go any further, one thing that you have to remember is this is the reason why, because you know, many a times in books when we are reading, we consider Shelley to be radical, we consider Shelley to be atheist, we consider Shelley to be absolutely uh, irreverent towards the supernatural power. No, it is just that he's against the corrupt practices uh, that people are adopting. He doesn't really think that because there is so much of badness and the good people are suffering. That is the reason he does not believe in uh, the proper like you know, uh, platform of praying. But nonetheless, he has other alternatives. Nonetheless, he is definitely definitely uh, trying to look at nature. He genuinely thinks nature, he genuinely thinks that people are uh, agents of change. They can change the society, they can revolutionize the society, they can actually bring a lot of transformation. So keep this point in mind that of course he's considered, he's expelled from Oxford because of the fact that he's writing the necessity of atheism. Uh, but at the same time, you must keep that in mind that he is a person who genuinely believes in the power of nature. He was a pantheist. He definitely thought that, you know, nature had that overpowering uh, power. But remember, he's just not praising nature. He's also telling you about the destructive side of nature. It is just not a proper prayer of nature. He's also telling you about the destructive nature, uh, the destructive pattern that nature has. For example, I can say that nature is beautiful. In nature, we can see God. But at the same time, you cannot deny deny that there are earthquakes that take place you can't deny that there are tsunamis that takes place there are tsunamis that take place right so that is what he's trying to talk about he's being very realistic that way so he's being very very realistic that way so genuinely he thought that natural objects also have life they also have soul and the last major work of Shelley was the triumph of the soul this is again a direct question that has been asked in your entrances that you have to keep in mind that you have to definitely 
you keep in mind triumph of the soul triumph of the soul this is the last major work that has been written by percy bisher shelley this is the last major work that has been written by pb shelley and he genuinely believed that nature had a soul nature had a soul right and when we are talking about right he's telling us about spirit of beauty the spirit of beauty uh, when he's talking about intellectual him to intellectual beauty so clearly we can see that he isn't a person who's absolutely irreverent he isn't that sort of a person who is uh, yes of course shubhangi you can say he was ahead of his time all the romantics were ahead of their times coleridge saudi also in a way but you know saudi and wordsworth knew how to be uh, in the society and then yet acquire positions so that way is of course they were very erudite okay so do keep that uh, do, do keep that in mind do remember that do uh, remember these are the aspects that you have to definitely keep in Mind. i'm just hiding myself so that you can read this aspect again as it is you will get the pdfs but do remember this aspect okay do remember this aspect because this is crucial this is important that he wasn't a complete atheist he genuinely believed in a supernatural power okay but please keep that in mind that he is just not praising nature he is also highlighting the destructive aspect of nature it is not an unalloyed appreciation it is not a pure appreciation of nature he is not wholly positive about about nature he's also telling you about how nature has got a destructive potential as well how nature has got a destructive potential as well that is what he's trying to tell us right how nature can be destructive as well that's also another point that he's trying to highlight okay so he says that of course nature is beautiful it is very vast it is phenomenal but at the same time don't get captivated only by the splendid nature because this nature is actually deadly as well <coughs> <laughs> sorry because this nature that you're talking about is deadly as well this nature that you're discussing is deadly as well okay so he does highlights the destructive nature the role of nature but he genuinely believes that just like nature just like you know for example the west wind take for example the west wind the west wind is an agent of change so is a poet the west wind is an agent of change so is the poet so he thought that nature is also the agent of change because of its destructive power and even a poet has got that potential even a poet has got that potential so you can clearly see the two major things that are emerging he was a radical of course but he loved nature he respected nature but at the same time he was realistic about dep depicting nature and the second important thing that you have to remember is that he considers a poet to be the agent of change he considers a poet to be the agent of change all right so that is of course an important aspect that you have to keep in mind and that is the reason in the defense of poetry uh, he's talking about which is an answer to the the entire response that like you know love peacock had so that is what thomas la peacock had he's saying poets are the unacknowledged legislators of mankind why they are unacknowledged because people have not understood they are the unacknowledged legislators they are the unacknowledged controllers they are the unacknowledged civilizers of mankind poets are the unacknowledged unacknowledged legislators of mankind poets can ensure that you know you're providing proper structure to the society so he's clearly highlighting the role of a poet he's clearly highlighting the role of a poet for everyone okay so do keep that in mind do remember this aspect this is of course crucial and here you've got a crit critic who's saying that you know that uh, what why essentially there are two things that you have to remember over here a romantic poet is looking inwards if this is a romantic poet he's definitely looking inwards for ideas but he's looking outwards for symbols how can he describe his ideas how can he talk about his ideas how can he discuss his ideas for example you know if i ask you what do you want to get if i give you 1 crore rupees you can say that i want a beautiful car or i want a beautiful house or i want furniture for my house but you know that symbol that you're creating inside you need outward symbols to describe those you need outward symbols to spell those out you need outward symbols so that you can coherently put that across right so in their search to find ways of expressing their internal feelings the romantic poets look outwards to nature to find emblems nature is giving them emblems what they are thinking inside nature is representing outside what they are undergoing inside nature is representing that outside
okay so that is something that you have to definitely keep in mind and just like we have seen that you know he considers nature for example in the ode to the west wind he considers west wind to be the agent of change he considers west wind to be the agent of change and that is the reason and that is the primary reason we can see that he's comparing the west wind to the poet he's comparing the west wind to the poet he thinks that the west wind is just like the poet the west wind is just like the poet that is what he's trying to convey that is what he's trying to highlight that the west wind is very similar to a poet he's trying to suggest a link between the power of nature and the poetic power of creation and destruction and the poetic power of creation and destruction all right so do keep that in mind do remember that those are all important details that you have to definitely keep in mind so don't just always whenever you are reading books uh consider shelley to be an absolute atheist and a complete radical he had the softer side with him he had the humanitarian side to him and radicalness does not mean that you are very hostile towards other radicalism means that you want change for others you want to be a change agent for others that is of course an important ingredient okay so do keep that in mind he had Had two marriages so he had two marriages that were very very important the second marriage of course was extremely crucial in shaping his ideas and identities he was a common uh come like you know he was a common visitor at the godwin household and that is how uh like you know both mary shelley and uh pb shelley so mary uh wollstonecraft or mary godwin and uh pb shelley they eloped together and they got married now shelley had eloped earlier also she shelley had eloped like you know he ran ran away when he was 16 years old he ran away with harriet westbrook he ran away he ran away with harriet westbrook he ran away with harriet westbrook and uh, they got married together also uh, now what happened was basically because of this he had a terrible relationship with his family because these all things were very conservative at that time and people were really not liking it and he was a person who was engaged in radical politics he was always actively involved with radical politics he was of course going right shelly he briefly uh, when he had gone to ireland when he had briefly gone and visited ireland he had written the utopian allegory queen map an address to the irish people queen map and an address to the irish people why queen map is called a, a utopian because it's very optimistic it is very very optimistic and you know this optimism actually continues there was a question that was given that which are the three most optimistic works of pb shelley the revolt of islam queen map as well as when we are talking about prometheus and bound these are three very important and long works which are absolutely optimistic they are very very optimistic he was an optimistic dreamer he was dreaming about reforming the society he always wanted to just reform the society that was his ultimate idea that was his ultimate intention so transforming the society making sure that you know there was an optimistic transformation in the society that was of course very important for him okay so that is something that you have to keep in mind he also met he also met saudi he met saudi uh, right uh, whom shelly of course mistook to be a radical he later on came to know that he was not a radical per se right he started corresponding with william godwin he was very active he was very very active in the the circles where radicalism was there and that is the reason if you would have gone through the video that i had shared on telegram a brief uh, like you know kind of a teaser video about what we will discuss today i told you that he was very popular with the political groups the political radical political groups of the 19th century the radical political groups of the 19th century loved him like crazy they really would read his works they would uh, really try to figure out what is shelly trying to convey via his works for example when you talk about the ovenist group or the chartist group they were genuinely inspired by the way he was behaving so these were all radical groups of the when we talk about the ovenist group the chartist group these are all radical groups these are very radical groups during the victorian age during the 19th century these are your radical groups and they are immediately going on and referring to shelley's writings they are looking at shelley's writings to get a, like you know stuff for them uh, for their meetings for example like you know uh, most of the times you will hear that many politicians also they use famous literary quotations to make their speeches much more powerful to make their speech which is much more impactful to ensure that there is more impact that is conveyed via their work that is of course present there 
so do keep that in mind do remember that whenever we are talking about shelly shelly is going towards the radical arena he is getting very inspired and later he is actually an inspiration for many radical groups later he a shelly is getting inspired by the radical groups and later he is the one who's inspiring the radical groups he's the one who's inspiring the radical groups these are your 19th century radical groups called the ovenist group and the chartist group called the ovenist group and the chartist group okay so do keep that in mind do remember that all right so this is something that you have to keep in mind good evening happy um good evening no worries govin that's perfectly all right so please keep that in mind that when we are talking about when we are talking about the marriages of course he is getting married to harriet westbrook but after that he is going towards radicalism after that he is moving towards radicalism Godwin influenced Shelley. Godwin had influenced Shelley. He he was a very important uh, force who influenced Shelley's idea of thinking rationally, of rational agents as citizens. How citizens can actually bring in transformation and change. That is something that he dearly believed. That is something that he dearly believed. Right. His marriage also ended in a fiasco. So his marriage ended in a complete fiasco. Right. Uh, so Shelley eloping to Switzerland with a sixteen-year-old Mary Godwin. Uh, so so this this entire marriage that had taken place with Harriet Westbrook that was a complete disaster because he again eloped. He again eloped with a sixteen-year-old Mary Godwin. right uh, they they fell in love with each other because he was a permanent member he was a permanent member who was coming to visit uh, the place of william godwin and that is the reason we see that you know he is ultimately getting infatuated and they both run away and get married so the first marriage with harriet westbrook was a complete failure was an utter failure it actually ended in the fiasco it actually ended in the fiasco because he had to he again got married to mary uh, godwin he is again getting married to mary godwin so that is of course the idea that you know it's not just he was a rad radical in his political ideas he was actually a radical even in his personal life he was not following the codes of decorum that the society had asked people who were getting married to follow good evening aman so do keep that in mind do remember that that there are two scandal there are two scandalous marriages that he is having the first point that you have to remember is harriet westbrook is the first wife <coughs> the second wife is mary godwin and in between he is getting excited about the radical ideas he is meeting people he is trying to sharpen his views he is trying to understand perspective and that is the difference between an intellectual person who is genuinely concerned about revolution versus someone who doesn't even check his facts okay and do remember this is very very important that he was extremely inspired by william godwin's idea of political justice the idea that were given by william godwin on political justice had immediately attracted the attention of pb shelley pb shelley was absolutely excited to know about godwin's notion of political justice so the two scandalous marriages you get direct questions in your entrances harriet westbrook as well as mary godwin harriet westbrook as well as mary godwin and of course he's going in between he's going to ireland he's trying to interact with godwin he's trying to meet a uh, uh, mary godwin also and thereby ultimately getting married to her as well okay now when you're talking about his uh, death of course like you know his death was in in a horrible circumstance in in the form of a boat uh, accident which many people had presented their utter disregard uh, their, their their utter distress as well as like you know tribute because he'd got he'd got drowned and he died and some people were very happy see this is what happens if you talk about god if you talk bad things about god see this is what what will happen so they didn't even spare him uh, during the hour of his death that is what what many critics thought that was very savage so he of course eloped he uh, eloped with mary shelley that was there right now when they eloped mary and shelley took them uh, took them with took them um, like you know to clear claremont with them uh, so it's not that they're running away just alone they're actually running away with a sister in law so imagine like you know i am mary i'm mapivi shelley i'm running with my sister in law as well so i'm getting claire also along with me so one life i've ruined because at that time eloping was horrible thing so uh, mary shelley's life is already like you know doomed but mary shelley have ma married so that's okay but they've got along claire also they've got along claire also so so that was of course like a major cause of concern that led to a lot of uh, bitter acrimony between many people in the family but still uh, eventually things were sorted they returned to england because you know they were penniless they were homesick they did not have any money left at all and uh, you know they had given birth to two children two children harriet um 
that was there uh, so 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 clearly what we can see is that they are they are having this very tumultuous life this very unconventional life where people over here you can see they are getting eloped they are not marrying according to the conventions of the society elopement is you are running away that means you are running away from the customs that means you are running away from the societal pressure that means you are running away from society itself that is what it symbolizes right that is what it symbolizes so do keep that in mind do keep that in scandalous scandalous go when scandalous is something that creates a lot of uh, furor people are discussing about it it's very it's like a humor it's spreading like wildfire so you're eloping that means you're running away bhag jana that is elopement so that was of course there now please remember that whenever we talk about pb shelley and his death of course there were there were really tragic tributes that were poured in for shelley Shelley was of course loved by everyone and Shelley was of course like you know at the same time really not concerned so much even after his elopement he was something that was not very very bothered but yes of course he was concerned about the economic aspect he was concerned about the economic aspect and that's the reason they had come again uh, so those are important things that you have to keep in mind the two early works that we have Queen Mab as well as Alistair or the Spirit of Solitude now Queen Mab is representing see i'll give you an example for example if some of you who are watching this video for the very first time and you start you make a plan today that you know i will study for my upcoming net exam okay i will study for my upcoming net exam and you've made an exhaustive plan you are very very excited you know during the initial days we are very excited we are very optimistic we are absolutely thrilled that yes you know we will conquer the world we will complete the syllabus we will follow the schedule and we will be uh, emerging as victorious and slowly and steadily with each passing day you have confusion you're worried how will i be able to manage how will i be able to cover what will i be able to do then you get worried then you get worried you get really stressed you get really stressed you get really worried now when we are talking about when we are talking about alastair when we are discussing about alastair or the spirit of solitude this is of course telling you about the times when he wanted to be a little alone and solitary after like you know the two scandalous marriages but queen map is telling you about the extreme optimism that he had the extreme optimism that he was having about the society changing and transforming that the society should be able to transform immediately that is what the belief that he had right so queen mab was a political work was a political poem and it was devoted to the fairy queen's speeches it was of course very optimistic in spirit it wanted to change the society with revolutionary zeal it is dealing about the theme of corruption also the vices that are discussed the vices the themes of corruption that are there classroom students i hope you can make a parallel between how your uh, scottish josarians and english josarians are also talking about they are also talking about the corrupt society or the vices of the clergy as well as the practice of usury so literature hasn't changed a lot from the times of chaucer till the romantic age literature is still becoming the vehicle of casting your criticism literature is a vehicle or a mode of registering your criticism or registering your complaints against the society how you're worried about the society all right for example there are so many works that are actually telling you about it and alastair alastair is suggested right the name alastair was suggested by thomas love peacock this is a direct question that comes in your exams right this is a direct question that comes in and you know this is a kind of a spiritual autobiography just like prelude was a kind of a spiritual autobiography of wordsworth so alastair is a spiritual autobiography of a pb shelley whereas when we are talking about the spiritual autobiography alastair is the spiritual autobiography of shelley and prelude is the spiritual autobiography of wordsworth prelude is the spiritual autobiography of wordsworth right this is a poem written in blank verse in blank verse about a youth of uncorrupted feelings and adventurous genius right adventurous genius he is a protagonist protagonist is a very shadowy protection projection of shelley himself so it was a very autobiographical work it was literally revealing the turmoil uh, that shelley was experiencing the problems that shelley was experiencing that is what it was discussing that is what it was looking at it wanted to quickly try and analyze all those aspects that was the main idea
Now, whenever you talk about the features of the poetry that Shelley has, he's of course a person who's writing, engaging in the musical quality of poetry. The poetry is lyrical. The poetry is ly lyrical. And we are having the Shellian hero. What is this concept of Shellian hero? What do we mean by the Shellian hero? The Shellian hero is a tragic prophetic hero. He's a tragic prophetic hero. Right. He is a hero who's absolutely tragic. He is a hero who's absolutely prophetic. He's absolutely grand. He's absolutely grand. Right. Protagonist is the main character. Protagonist is the main character. So why? Why is he grand character? Why are we talking about a Shellian character to be grand? That is because Shelley was a visionary. Shelley genuinely was a dreamer. He actually wanted the society to improve. He wanted everyone to embrace the freedom that can be given to citizens without intervention. He never wanted people to come in between his life's decisions. He never ever wanted people to make sure that, you know, people are trying to, in a way, talk about stuff which is, uh, w w which, which cannot be achieved, talking about limitation. No, he was always a dreamer, a visionary. He was a person who was a, extremely against authoritative regime. So he was a rebel against tyranny. He never wanted people to pay a lot of, uh, like, you know, a lot of stress on bounding others. That is something that he never believed in. Right. So he is a person who is a visionary. He has this entire idea to transform the society. He has this entire notion of like, you know, the society being uh, in a way this huge big world wherein you can clearly see that, you know, it can be it is capable of transforming. It is capable of becoming a better place. That is, of course, there. Right. That is the idea that he's trying to convey. He is trying to passionately reveal his radical thoughts. They're simple yet passionate. Those are the vehicles of his radical thought because otherwise how can he project his radical thought? How can he project his radical thinking? There, we can clearly see that, you know, there is, of course, political poetry that he's engaging in. He's being very radically enthused. He is trying to be a radical uh, person. He wants to ensure that people are radically driven towards other aspects. So that is a thing that Shelley is uh, commonly associated with. That is an aspect that Shelley is almost known for. Shelley is also, of course, writing prose about which we'll, of course, talk about. But the defense of poesy or the defense of poetry, the title that was inspired by Sir Philip Sedney's Apology for Poesy or Defense of Poesy. That is the reason you've got a defense of poesy over here also. We'll, of course, come on to this prose work. Tyranny is oppression. Tyranny is when you're controlling. Tyranny is or tyrannical is when you're just trying to ensure that people listen to you. You've become a dictator. That is tyranny. You are wanting unbridled control on others that is tyranny okay so do keep that in mind do remember it do remember this this point is of course important now when we are talking about byron and hunt when like you know the shelleys went to switzerland uh, they again went to switzerland with claire now of course claire was pregnant with byron's child uh, so clearly claire is the same person who's running away who's running away with mary shelley and bb shelley claire is the same person who's running away with mary shelley and bb shelley Right. The summer they spent with Byron in Geneva in Geneva in 1816 was, of course, very important. It was very similar to how, you know, Wordsworth and Coleridge are meeting together for the very first time. The same kind of meeting was there between, of course, P.B. Shelley. So we had Shelley as well as Byron <clears throat> meeting. It was very, very intellectually stimulating. Here we can see that Shelley was writing him to intellectual beauty as well as Mont Blanc. <gasps> <coughs> Sorry, him to intellectual beauty and Mont Blanc. Him to intellectual beauty and Mont Blanc were written over here. Okay, uh, Swati Cha has asked a question What is the difference between a Shellian hero and a Byronic hero? A Byronic hero is a celebrity. A Byronic hero, I will give you the example. For example, you know, five to six years ago, um, when, when we guys were. Uh, 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 five to ten years or uh, five to six years ago you know the honey sing for example was very very popular honey sing songs were very very popular then after that you know we had Bacha come in right and his songs in the northern part i'm talking about northern part or in delhi the punjabi culture the songs that you're having those are the kind of songs that were very popular right so person like honey sing person like Bacha, Bacha himself says that i'm a womanizer so Bacha, who's actually a singer he himself says that i'm a womanizer 
Now, these are the kind of people who are Byronic heroes. These are the kind of people who are Byronic heroes. Byronic heroes are aristocrats. Byronic heroes are people who are celebrities. Byron was, his, he was more popular as a celebrity than for his poetry. People wanted to know more about Byron's life than his art. People wanted to know more about what was happening with him than what was happening with his characters. That was Byron for you. And those were the kind of heroes that he had. The Byronic heroes are heroes that are extremely, they are like a prodigal child, they're wastrel, they, they have this head heart. So Rochester also from Jane Eyre becomes a Byronic hero. There are multiple examples in history of Byronic hero. Whereas a Shellian hero is a person who is believing in the power of radical change that can come in. He's believing about the, the, the cleansing of the entire environment. And by environment, I don't mean the, uh, the natural environment. I mean the conditions of the society. That is what they want to do. That is what they want to discuss, right? Now, when, uh, yeah, Navsing, I will be talking about that in the 8 p.m. class. So don't worry about it, okay? Uh, all right. So here, when you are talking about here, when you are discussing about that, you know, what is the difference between a Byronic hero and a Shellian hero? A Shellian hero is a person who is believing in radicalism. A Shellian hero is much more committed. A Shellian hero has ambition, not for himself or for his fashions, but to change the world. A Shellian hero is much more responsible than a Byronic hero. A Shellian hero will commit mistakes not of the nature like Byron does. Byronic heroes will commit mistakes of card parties, playing, uh, enjoying their money, wasting their money. Shellian hero are much more progressive in that way. Okay, so do keep that in mind. That is, of course, important. Now, when we are talking about Shelley, Shelley also, he was, of course, moving in the intellectual circles of Leigh Hunt, right? So he moved in the intellectual circles of Leigh Hunt. Hunt actually had given Shelley favorable reviews in the examiner. Hunt was because, because of this. Can you just see? Because Shelley was meeting. Shelley was meeting. That is the importance of networking. That is the importance of networking that these romantic poets had understood. Because Shelley was actually meeting, as Shelley was actually meeting uh, the people like Leigh Hunt who were the reviewers, therefore they had a favorable opinion about him. They did not discourage him at all. Hunt introduced Shelley to Keats. Hunt was the one who introduced Shelley to Keats. So he was finally introduced to Keats, Keats as well. So please remember there is this question also that gets framed that the examiner was liberal about or the examiner was less strict about. They were not at all critical about P.B. Shelley. They were not at all strict about P.B. Shelley. They were not at all worried about P.B. Shelley because they were the, they were the, yes, of course, Heathcliff is also an example of Byronic hero. Okay, now Shelley was also writing Laon and Sintha. Laon and Sintha is a work that P.B. Shelley was writing. Laon and Sintha is a work that was there. And this poem is featuring the incestuous lovers, right? The incestuous lovers, it's attacking religion as well. It is telling you about the incest. Incest is when you're uh, like, you know, you are falling in love with a person who is a part of your family. That's incestuous. That is incestuous. So clearly we can see Laon and Sintha, uh, a, a story about licentious lovers, licentious lovers, incestuous lovers, as well as it is attacking religion. It is attacking religion. Basically, who was the major, who was the major enemy for Shelley convention? Society, sticking to one notion, was the ultimate, like, you know, biggest, biggest enemy of P.B. Shelley. This was something that Shelley did not encourage at all. This was something that Shelley did not like at all. Okay, so do keep that in mind. Don't worry, you will get the PDF. Okay, don't worry about that. I will enlarge it from tomorrow, but you will. Uh... Yes, of course, of course. See, uh, what was happening? What was happening? Remember, I told you, uh, this is a question by Harsha. Harsha, what was happening that when? So the first he had, first marriage he had with Westbrook. The second marriage that he had with Mary Shelley, he had eloped with Mary Shelley also. But along with Mary Shelley, he had got Mary Shelley's, Mary Shelley's sister Claire along. This is the same Claire who will have the, uh, who will have the, like, you know, the, the, the child of Lord Byron. She's the same Claire who's having the child of Lord Baron. Okay, Byron. So that is the same. That's the point, the first point. And the second point that we are talking about is that when they are going, when they are going with Byron to Geneva, that time is very intellectually stimulating. That time is very intellectually stimulating. 
okay so do keep that in mind now before we go on to these kind of poems let's let's of course look at these two poems also first there are two major important poems him to intellectual beauty the questions from this come directly there is him to intellectual beauties where you get questions that are asked this is telling you this is of course telling you that you know intellectual beauty is basically when you are when you are able to understand when you are able to understand the idea of what is beautiful without ascribing without aspiring things that will like you know for example if you consider cosmetic beauty to be appreciate a worth appreciating that will die out that will die away intellectual beauty beauty looks at permanent sources of beauty intellectual beauty is looking at uh, not temporary sources of beauty but permanent sources of beauty that is what they're looking at that is what they're looking at that is what their major understanding is right so that is uh, a point that you have to keep in mind and mont blanc mont blanc the lines written in the veil of chamuni the lines written in the veil of chamuni this is an ode which compares the power of mountain against the power of human imagination the power of mountain and the human imagination both are mont blanc is telling you mont blanc is telling you that both are trying to eternalize stuff a mountain will also remain for so many years and the work of a poetic imagination will also be eternal the work of poetic and uh, poetic imagination will also surpass his age right he emphasizes the ability of human imagination to uncover the truth the un to uncover the truth that how human imagination can actually ensure that we are going towards the direction of knowledge about human civilization about humanness about human feeling right yes of course lichi we will discuss it don't worry about it you see these these all youtube classes are of course preliminary classes so don't worry about it okay we will schedule a uh, sessions wherein we'll complete your course also in a proper manner and with your 10 pm classes also we can actually start um in a proper structured way so i don't think that will be an issue okay yeah so do keep that in mind do remember that that in more blank is telling you about the power of poetry a the power of poetry is like the mountains it will surpass age we will die but the poetry will remain and second how it is used for ensuring that you are you are trying to uncover the truth you are trying to uncover the reality that is of course important so those are some aspects that are getting conveyed those are some aspects that are getting conveyed over here all right now what we'll do is uh we will stop over here <clears throat> in the want of time we will of course continue from here itself you don't have to worry i will share the pdf up until this point and some additional reading material on shelly what you have to keep in mind is shelly is a very optimistic poet shelly is a poet who is very radical and that is the reason he is getting uh, like you know appreciation from the other radical uh, scholars as well you know harold bloom has called him a great craftsman harold bloom said that you know sh whenever you talk about shelly shelly is a great class craftsman harold bloom made a very critical uh, like you know uh, assessment of him and he said that he is a master craftsman he is a master craftsman he is a superb craftsman right he is a superb craftsman so he is definitely one of the greatest superb craftsmen that you are having you also come to know that how he is a lyric poet how he is radical he is radical he is lyric he is using and that is the reason we can see that you know he is a person who's getting appreciation in the radical community as well okay now what we are doing is um uh, yeah so what we have done is what you have to keep in mind is that shelly is of course a radical poet a second generation romantic we will of course cover from here only some other important aspects that are related to shelly but do remember that he was a visionary and an optimistic at heart okay we will stop over here uh, we will uh, we will address your doubts why am i stopping over here today a little like you know 5 minutes uh, prior also is because of the fact that you know i will be meeting you guys at 10 pm today so i will be meeting you guys at 10 pm today we will continue we will continue uh, from there so don't worry about it okay yes shruti absolutely he did he was uh, so anything that was conventional shelly was against it anything that was conventional shelly was absolutely against that okay so we will uh, yes we will continue from here only in the 10 pm class that we are having and uh, along with that we'll of course discuss the main idea that we have how you can remember things so please do join in for the 10 pm class uh, maybe even if you're feeling sleepy you can just like you know come switch on your um, your audios and just listen at least so that some information can pass through 
all right take care i'll see you guys at 10 bye god bless